I have a lot of fondness for Magical Girl anime. I vaguely remember my sister watching Sailor Moon as a kid, but it wasn't until my total entrance into the inescapable depths of anime obsession in my later teens and now early 20s that I finally discovered my unabashed love for this particular niche within it. The gorgeous aesthetics mix of positivity, childish charm, and often just the right dash of macabre. I greatly appreciate how a lot of them focus on emotions and characters, having the powers themselves be an expressive abstraction of the feelings at play, a very cathartic kind of realization of something that is often so hard to understand and express. Now, despite that praise and the fact I've really enjoyed a lot of the ones I have seen, there are still so, so many I want to check out. I'm in a constant state of adding more and more to my plan to watch with the knowledge that it's likely going to take me years at best to get to some of these at my current rate. But anyways, with that desire to actively seek out more Maho Shoujo also comes one of my favorite ways of looking at any medium and genre, watching the progression. In short, I love seeing the new, the old, and the in-between. Appreciating the differences, the influence, just everything. Art is an amazing lineage of human expression, and I always enjoy seeing that put in perspective. So for this video, I want to focus on where this lovely genre got its start in anime, and take a look at Maho Shoujo in the 1970s. And also, like, the two that started before the 70s. Mahotsukai Sally or Sally the Witch is the very first Magical Girl anime, and what a perfect show to kick things off with. Episodes 1 through 7 and oddly 42 through 48 have been fan subbed, but it's honestly criminal that that is all there is. Not only is it a huge landmark, but it is genuinely really good. Though some pre-80s shows tend to struggle a bit in terms of production, Sally utilizes its limited animation well and looks great, with strong direction and a well-executed sense of comedic timing. Most important, of course, Sally herself is endlessly adorable, a wink and giggle strong enough to cure the souls of even the toughest creature. The series follows Sally, a princess of the Magic Kingdom, after she comes down to the human world, curious to check it out and tired of studying. As a college dropout, I can relate. From there, she meets and befriends the humans Yoshiko and Sumire, and decides to spend time on Earth learning how they live, in spite of her father demanding she return. Sally's magic is pretty much unlimited and seemingly all-powerful, able to will an entire house into existence in the matter of seconds. But the intrigue comes from the culture shock of being met with a new world with entirely different ways of operating. Sally is adorable, but also flawed, tending to act on whatever happens to interest her without much thought for responsibility. However, as the series continues, she matures and grows little by little. While the limited number of episodes available to me does, in turn, limit my perspective, there does seem to be a real sense of progression with the character, something I'd love to see more of. Sally's got a super charming kind of smarminess to her. Taking pleasure in playing with whatever bullies try to push her and her friends around, unaware of Sally's immense power. In the first episode, Sally's younger brother Kabu is told to come and bring her back, but ends up sticking around since Sally refuses to follow him, and they come across some no-good robbers, which results in a hilariously sadistic sequence of slapstick. There's a ton of fun little pranks and gags, but it's all tied up in some genuine heart. In one episode, Kabu butts heads with Yoshiko's troublesome younger brothers, but gains some empathy on finding out their mother died young. All throughout it is a strong sense of comedy paired with well-executed and extremely natural emotional moments. Episode 3 is a fantastic Christmas episode that should 100% be added to any list of anime episodes to watch when that time of the year comes around, and honestly, I could just describe each episode, but I think it's best to experience it for yourself. Even with it being incomplete, I'd still strongly recommend giving what there is a watch. Then we both can jam along to the absolute bangers it has as an OP and ED. <laughs> Mambo, 
秘密を No Uncle John. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> Got a little too into it there. Very nice. Thank you. Though airing three years after Sally in 1969, the manga for this is apparently the very first Maho Shoujo manga, beginning serialization in 1962, and authored by Fujio Akatsuka, creator of Osumatsu-kun and a bunch of other gag manga. Akatsuka said he likes to be the first to do something, and this certainly seems to have been something really new at the time, in spite of how big it would later grow to be. On the Fujio Akatsuka wiki, it even states that his idea for a series where a young girl transforms with a magical object, of which Akuchan was the first of its kind, was initially dismissed as being too silly. Though unfortunately, I can't find any more trustworthy sources to back this up. Though it would definitely fit in with his express mentality of wanting to do something that no one else was doing. I mean, the man even made a manga in Braille. The series also has my all-time favorite anime director Isao Takahata, Studio Ghibli co-founder, credited as assistant director. Himitsu no Akko-chan has Akko bestowed with a magical mirror, which gives her the ability to change her appearance—a token of goodwill after she buried a broken mirror, playing into the Japanese belief in Shinto that even household items can have souls. Akko showed the mirror love and respect, and as a result, it was able to pass on and become a star in the sky, leaving this new mirror as, I suppose, a token of goodwill for her kind-heartedness. All that, though, is literally like the first two minutes of episode one. The power doesn't work if someone is watching, so thus it is, as the title translates, Akko's Secret. The premise, as you can imagine, has pretty much infinite potential. A power that's extremely diverse but limited enough that there's always going to be some sort of trouble to overcome, turning something like trying to dodge a surprise test into a full episode's worth of conflict. It helps that Akko is not exactly the best liar. With the rate she's going, I'm surprised this secret ran for so long. The character designs in particular stand out to me quite a bit, made of these super exaggerated shapes, with the more comedic the character, the more absurdly proportioned their design. Unfortunately, only one episode of this particular season has been fan-subbed, setting up the power and having Akko manipulate things to try and get a raised allowance and get their class out of a test. Look, she's still good-hearted, but, you know. Perhaps in the future I'll talk about one of the later installments, though in the winter episode of my series covering every anime in 1989, my friend Manmo did talk about a fully translated short movie that came out a bit of the way into Akko-chan 2's run, so I'll link that below if you're interested. Overall, a pretty decent introduction with some great background music. Cat characters, though, not exactly my favorites of the bunch. <laughs> Maho no Mako-chan takes us into the next decade with its start in 1970, and as the first and only translated episode, it was actually pretty impressive. Plot-wise, the episode basically follows beat for beat the story of the Little Mermaid. Mako-chan defies her father and goes above sea, falls in love with a human whom she saves, and chooses to forever sacrifice her mermaid life to gain legs and enter the human world, closing with her sprawled out on the beach after the painful transformation. Of course, with all this done in like 20 minutes, I think you can see how it might be a bit difficult to buy into her willingness to sacrifice everything for someone she doesn't even know. Even more so as that was already a common issue in other adaptations of the story that gave things far more time than this. And yet it is still rather compelling, thanks to how the presentation manages to sell it. There's a gorgeous sweeping orchestral score, striking visuals with beautiful backgrounds and accentuated lighting, seeing the crashing waves with blaring horns as she fights to rescue her love, or the swelling strings as she looks back tearfully at the home she can never return to. It comes together to convey those powerful moments and strong emotions in spite of its limited time. That stellar soundtrack was handled by the incredible Takio Watanabe, who worked on a lot of major 70s anime like Attack No. 1, Heidi Girl of the Alps, Cutie Honey, Ie Nakiko, Gundam 79, and much more. His output is insanely impressive, crafting beautiful musical landscapes with an incredible ear for melody and orchestration. 
Without his touch, the show wouldn't be nearly as enjoyable or emotionally engaging. Now, what I was the most curious about after I finished that first episode was about what could possibly come after. Because there's no way the rest of it follows the story, at least as closely as episode 1 did. Since considering the pace of the setup, it's just impossible that that alone would last the show's full 48 episode run. Well, the rest does seem to diverge from the story, Mako being able to talk and becoming a high school student, and along the way facing the difficulties of the world as she waits to meet the man she fell in love with once more. Seems like lots and lots of suffering is involved along the way, continually challenging her good heart, but she still chooses to believe in humankind, and her parents grant her a magic pendant to call upon if she ever finds herself in dire need. I watched a few beyond the single subbed episode and I was into it. I could easily see myself finding a lot to love in here, especially if it builds upon those themes of a meaningful life in spite of suffering. Mako transformed into a human by swallowing a tear she shed, which her grandmother said was a sign that she had already become a human in her heart, for that pain sorrow is unknown to mermaid kind. Though perhaps humanity bears its own little joys as well. Fushigi na Melmo is bizarre. A 1971 adaptation of a manga by Osamu Tezuka, it jumps right into the action with Melmo's mother dying horribly in a car crash. <laughs> then weeping to God to give her a second chance because she's the only one taking care of her daughter and two sons. She is luckily granted the chance to make but one request, though she can't return herself. And that request is that they grow up so that they can take care of themselves. What this results in is her ghost giving the nine-year-old eldest Melmo a jar full of small candies, which depending on the one that you eat will increase or decrease your age. Melmo uses this to thwart the cruel caretaker, and also accidentally lets the youngest turn back into an egg. It's pretty ridiculous. Though then there's this sequence where she figures out how to turn him back, which is super surreal, and a total sudden change from the fast paced in your face comedy. And there's also the fact that the show is quite strangely sexual for a kid's show. Everything about it is incredibly odd. The show features what I think may be the most ugly anime character ever conceived of in this caretaker, to the extent that she is unpleasant to watch, even though that's precisely the point. Look how gross she is, oh my god. Someone had to draw that. Melmo ends up handcuffed to a guy on a hectic drive because he was so annoyed at her calling his driving reckless that he had to show her, I guess. And then she turns into a baby and pisses on him, and then turns old, and then the narrator is monologuing about the meaning of age and maturity, and what the fuck, this is only the first episode! According to Wikipedia, it was supposedly intended to be an introduction of sorts to sex education and Darwinist evolution. Everything about it is bizarre as hell, the characters, the visuals, it all feels like a strange, uncomfortable distortion of reality. I can't say I particularly enjoyed the experience, but it certainly was was rather fascinating. In another 1971 anime, we are introduced to the intriguing character of Etsuko Sarutobi. A mysterious transfer student before it was cool, she joins the Mitsuba Elementary School and immediately draws attention with her strange nature. Sarutobi Etchan adapts the manga of the same name by Shotaro Ishinomori, creator of Cyborg 009 and the Kamen Rider series. It follows the escapades of Etsuko, a descendant of the famous ninja Sasuke Sarutobi, a famous ninja from Japanese folklore. Etsuko backs this up with absurd magic tricks and human strength and taking everyone aback at the immense power within this tiny, tiny, tiny girl. This one has a much flatter aesthetic that is reminiscent of series like Doraemon, and uses the simple designs for fun expressions and good comedic moments. What especially sells it is Etsuko herself, cause she's cute. Reminds me of Suyu with her delightful froggy face, like I ended up just taking screen caps every time she was in frame simply because her default face is so inherently appealing. She doesn't talk too much, often giving only a simple in reply. 
That paired with her power and facial expression that rarely reveals what she is really thinking adds this delightful mysterious element to her character, a mix of nonchalance and naivete that makes her a joy to watch, as every character is in awe while her response is always very chill and straightforward. Small characters being super powerful is always a fun dynamic, and seeing everyone play off of her in a variety of ways made the one translated episode a lot of fun to watch. As I was reading up on the series, I discovered that apparently it performed pretty poorly at the time and got cancelled only 26 episodes in, though it's since found more success in re-release. That's really unfortunate because it is genuinely quite charming, and I'd love to spend more time with this wonderful, weird, adorable, little magician, ninja, frog, girl, something. It was well. Here we have the 1972 series Mahotsukai Chappie, which is totally untranslated. Sick. This series is pretty strikingly similar to Sally, yet another magician in training desiring instead to experience the human world, even having a slapstick sequence of them using magic to beat up the baddies that was rather reminiscent of a similar scene in Sally's first episode. The main differences are that their power is much less godlike, especially for Chappie and her younger brother, and that the whole family ends up staying in the human world together rather than the main character being separated. The most amusing parts of it come from the dad, whose magic abilities are way high but struggles to adjust without them, as they obviously want to hide their powers. Just seeing his somewhat serious demeanor with that thick beard stash and all then forced into situations of distress is inherently amusing to me. Miracle Shoujo Limit-chan. What can I say about this one? Well, it came out in 1973, and it has animation? The series follows the titular Limit, who gains special powers after being turned into a cyborg to save her from the verge of death, though she, as expected, hides her true nature in fear of being seen as different. Oddly enough, the introductory episode, which is also the only translated one, doesn't even focus on introducing us to Limit at the start, spending most of the time on this bullyish character instead. She pops up to covertly save a kid after he ends up in a dangerous situation during a spat with the bully, invites some kids over to help fix their clothes, it doesn't it doesn't even start to give you an idea of what the main character is like until like halfway through the episode. And then suddenly 100% it's a limit espousing her deep emotional conflict and backstory like 0 to 100. That gave me quite the bout of whiplash. Between that and the bleh aesthetic gaudy colors and unpleasant designs, this one certainly seems far from the decade's best. Also genuinely, what the hell were they thinking with that outfit? This is also about a robot girl, and it kicks ass. An adaptation of a manga by the insanely influential Go Nagai of Devilman and Mazinger fame, the 1973 series Cutie Honey follows the likewise named protagonist, an android who must fight against the mysterious organization Panther Claw. At first but a rebellious girl attending Catholic school, a hologram of her father tells her her true power after he dies in a raid from the group. They were after his creation, the Atmospheric Element Solidifier, a special piece of technology that can create matter, something that could make gold and diamonds from thin air. What they don't know is that Honey herself is where the secret tool is located, utilizing it to change her appearance into a variety of different themes each episode, as she faces off against the Panther Claw with her special powers, great strength, and enhanced combat abilities. Compared to the other anime we're looking at today, this one is definitely the most adult. Cutie is sexy and by design, the sharp angles giving the show a cool look and serving only to accentuate her sexuality further. She stabs her enemies right through the heart with a brutal finish, it's fucking awesome! Each 
Each episode usually has one member of the Panther Claw and some of their generic goons either trying to bait Cutie into capture to get the solidifier, or having them stealing some valuable item as she helps to recover it, always ending in a fight between her and the Panther, with, of course, the Panther facing death each time. Sorry, uh, about the spoilers, I guess. Alongside Honey, there's Hayami Seiji, a reporter she meets early on who discovers her secret in whom she often teams up with. Though funnily enough, he also often ends up serving the damsel in distress role. Other periodic members of the squad are his father Danbei, an old dude who is very affectionate toward Honey and extremely adept in martial arts, and his younger brother Junpei, who I can only think to describe as milady in a character. He's even got his own girl of sorts, but the second he sees Honey's honkers, this boy drops to his knees like he's seen the face of God. Understandable. The animation can definitely be a bit stiff and off-model, but the core aesthetic and strong design sense carries it. There's plenty of creative visual stuff, scenes with limited color palettes paneling the way it sets background characters in solid, various colors, which I imagine save time but also makes for some cool visuals. It's imaginative enough to stay consistently fun to look at in spite of the weaknesses. Now, for all my praise, I will admit the show is very formulaic. Each episode follows almost the exact same structure. For me, the main character is so entertaining and fun to watch that each episode ends up being enjoyable. Everyone in the show has the hots for Honey, and I'm right there with them. She's badass, cool, funny, just a general pleasure to watch, and that paired with the great soundtrack and strong visual identity kept me into it. The general vibe of the show just clicked with me, which was kind of surprising since I'm usually not super big into action-heavy shows. And the OP, man, that shit is god-tier. I cannot stop listening to it. It's been stuck in my head, like, all week. Please. Someone help me! Here is 1974's Majoko Megu-chan, and I've run out of creative introductions. Megu is training to become the new queen of the witches, and as a part of her training, she comes to the human world to study with a witch that married a human and has a human family. That witch then uses a magic enchantment to make them love her and think she is one of the family, and I don't know, am I the only one who thinks that's kind of fucked up? The theme of the show is actually trying to talk about the importance of love, and then the basis of the love is a false premise? It seems a tad off. Her quote-unquote brother is trying to take pics of her in her underwear. Hmm. I just can't get invested in this family. They're all unlikable, and it jumps the gun on the big moments before making much attempt to invest the audience. Who wants a family? Who wants love? Those words aiming to strike some emotional chord ultimately ring rather hollow with the level of setup. She gets into a fight in the first episode with this rival character and ends up close to death after running away from the family following a bit of conflict. And her witch trainer says, oh look, see how much they care, but they were literally altered by magic to care! That's not real love! Ah! I generally do my best to be fair and respectful, but this show in particular really gets my goat with this gross manipulation and specific kind of thematic focus on totally unconditional, unreasonable, unjustified love that I always, always hate. So yeah, take that as you will. Majoko Tickle is yet another manga and anime Maho Shoujo from the mind of Go Nagai, premiering in 1978. The premise has the character Chiko opening a magic book and releasing Tickle, a fairy who was, to quote her directly, imprisoned in the Thousands of Jokes castle because she plays too many jokes. Man, what a creative name, I wonder how they could have possibly thought that one up. In the singular subtitled debut episode, there's a bit of conflict with Chiko at first being understandably doubtful of Tickle's claims of magical ability, but eventually she realizes Tickle is being honest and Tickle joins the family to learn of the human world and also mostly goof around. She also uses magic to convince Chico's family she's one of them, but it's played in a much more lighthearted way than the previous series. Tickle's got a fun, mischievous edge to her, which I could see leading to some enjoyable antics, though it's definitely less striking than Go Nagai's previous work, Cutie Honey. It's far more lighthearted for one, but honestly the differences go to the extent that I would not have been able to guess in a million years that these came from the same individual. 
I could easily see some amusing moments arising out of this cast, though the characterization wasn't quite strong enough to get me super invested. Final Maho Shoujo of the decade were going out incredibly strong with Hana no Ko Lun Lun. Let me explain. You see, humans and flower fairies lived together on Earth long ago, but eventually the fairies grew tired of the humans' growing ego and left for the planet of flowers. Some fairies, however, chose to stay on Earth, married humans, and that flower fairy blood continued. In order to anoint a new ruler, the flower in seven colors must be found, and it can only be found by one of those flower child descendants. And so, with that definitely not at all contrived setup, our lovely Lun Lun is discovered to be one of those, and sets out on a journey to find the flower. Her grandparents are more than happy to send their daughter off on this potentially dangerous journey with only two weird talking animals they just met as companions, but whatever, let's keep going. Apparently if you find the flower you're granted great happiness or something, so I guess it's worth it. She's also given the key of flowers, a magical item that draws upon the flower power to allow her to change into a variety of different outfits to disguise or potentially protect. Now the general structure has her traveling from place to place in search of this flower, and each time along the way she meets some unique characters with problems that she helps resolve. For instance, in the first episode she stops the train in order to help out a house they see burning. At first, no one but a handsome cameraman named Sergei wants to help her, and they leave them behind. But eventually they feel guilty and come back to help, with everyone's joint efforts preventing the damage from being severe. Or take another episode where she meets and ends up staying with a kind artist when her wallet is stolen. He wants to study in Paris, but his father doesn't understand and is harshly opposed. The father wanted to share his passion, farming, with his son, but doesn't understand his son's difference in perspective and interest. However, by showing a genuine sense of interest and care for the father's passion, with some effort she gets him to break down his walls just enough to open up to seeing the care of the son. Showing them the importance of persistence in pursuing one's dreams, Lun Lun teaches through her actions and makes everyone she meets a better person. It's no wonder the English title localized it as Angel. As she travels, trailing in her wake is Sergei, who she continually, accidentally, runs into, as he helps her out and gives flower seeds to those she aids, each episode ending with the narrator describing the meaning of those flowers he gave in the language of flowers, which relates to whatever the theme or moral of the episode was and serves as a nice reminder to those characters of that connection and lesson learned. Also following her trail, this girl is really fucking popular, is Togenishia and her Tanaki stooge Boris, for Togenishia wants to steal the flower once it's found so that she has claimed to be queen. The rich beauty quick to anger and her more humorous assistant that struggles to meet her expectations make for a fun pairing all on their own, helping to move the plot along and being enjoyable enough that cutting to them never took away from the experience. The whole thing gives me similar vibes to world masterpiece theater shows like Heidi and Anne, it's so wholesome. The way she opens people's hearts, the music, the visuals, the characters, the show feels warm and comfy and sweet and so kind. I was immediately taken with this girl. The very first scene shows her playing with the boys, getting a bit dirty and shrugging it off. She's clearly capable, fun-loving, and also, as we see after, extremely kind and empathetic. She's got the tomboy and the super feminine, like how perfect can you get? I love the character designs in this, which are credited largely to Shingo Araki and Michi Himeno, a duo that worked on series like Rose of Versailles, Saint Seiya, Yu-Gi-Oh, and a ton more. I'm way into the beautiful eyes and twisty hair, it looks absolutely gorgeous. The backgrounds as well have a lot of life to them, the establishing shots and diverse perspectives making each location have a feeling of real dimension, which is a particularly important tool of getting us invested in each new community we come across during this journey, and making each new place really feel like a fresh new location. All around, in terms of production, this is definitely the best so far. The backgrounds, character art, animation, it looks great. Most unfortunate is, as you should be used to by this point, of course it's not fully translated, with only four currently subbed, though hopefully that'll change in the future. I mentioned an English version, and actually there are two, a Harmony Gold dub that took six out of the 50 episodes and cut them together into a 95 minute film that was released on VHS in 1987 under the title Flower Angel, and a dub by Ziv, 
or ZIV International, I'm not sure what it is, that was broadcast on HBO under the title Angel. However, only the first two episodes were broadcast, with a later VHS release that also contained episodes 3 and 4 in 1982 under the title The Flower Angel. You might actually be unknowingly aware of this dub, as Kenny Lauderdale has a pretty famous clip of it on his channel. Why are you stopping? I'm going to release the bees. Bees are in the garden. Go use the insect spray. But if you spray the flowers, you'll harm the bees. Just get rid of them. Stop spraying. The bees will be harmed. And so are you. Well, it's certainly something. For its strange licensing history, the series itself was delightful, and I thoroughly enjoyed my time with it. Hopefully one day I'll come back and rejoin the journey for the flower in seven colors, as Lun Lun continues to share her beautiful heart with all she meets. Did I mention I love her? And that's all of them! Every Maho Shoujo before the 80s. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed myself and I hope you did too. It's interesting to compare this with what later Maho Shoujo I've seen, such as the fact that many of these focus on an outsider type character, someone from a magic land of some sorts who comes to the human world, rather than a normal human who is granted power and a mission. In fact, many of these lack any type of clear villain whatsoever, at most episodic conflicts with some variety of mean person. There's also a big focus on changing appearance and outfits established pretty early on, which is definitely something that sticks around, though here it seems that purely changing appearance in itself was often impressive enough of an ability to be the main attraction. There were a lot of super cool, fun, and genuinely good shows in that batch, so hopefully sharing my experience was a good time and maybe piqued your interest in one or the other. For a much more in-depth look, I'd recommend checking out the Maho Profile series by Aaron Cerise. Do be sure to let me know what you thought in the comments and correct me if I got anything wrong. I'm far from perfect after all. Leave a like and share the video if you want to see more like this, and perhaps I'll have to take a look at Maho Shoujo in the 80s sometime soon. Special thanks to all my patrons who are on screen right now, your support is greatly appreciated. Also be sure to follow my Twitter at Core Reviews and check out my Twitch, I stream pretty frequently with a wide variety of stuff. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.